was there. Anyway, great. So glad to see so many people here. It's really, really good. Um, I'm great to be back in, in Gothenburg. Um, I'm going to talk to you about um, a tool called Diffoscope. So, um, hi. Um, so, quick thing about me. I've been an open source free software developer for over, over 10 years now. I can't really find the first thing I ever did. I just sort of fell into it. I'm the current Debian project leader, um, starting my second term. Very nice. I'm on the board of the Open Source Initiative. Um, that's going to be the recent one. And I'm, my, I'm a freelance software developer, um, doing all sorts of things, web development, security stuff, um, some embedded systems and things like that. So that's what I do. I like to play around with computers quite a lot. For example, here's an operating system I made that is where it's a live CD that just um, per, plays the movie Hackers on repeat. It's pretty good for putting on a USB stick, um, one of those kiosk machines in like hotels. You just leave it in there, plays. Plays out the RAM as well, so you can take the USB stick away. Just plays out. <laughs> um, someone once asked on IRC, can you get CP to give a progress bar like WGET? Well, yeah, of course, if you use strace. Um, yeah, you pass the output of S-Trace. You, know, you could use something else, but that's no fun at all. And then, then, then you can see it half working there. Yeah, well. And another one is um, a sudoku solver in PostScript. I mean, why, why not, basically? So um, you, this sort of, you can maybe see the, the yellow thing there. But the cool thing is, if you send this to a real PostScript printer with a PostScript interpreter in the printer itself, it's the actual printer that does the solving of it, not like the rendering before you printed it. Anyway, you know, you, you've all done this kind of nonsense. Anyway, and in my spare time, spare time, I pretend to be a musician of some or rock early music, things like that. Anyway, great. So, Diffoscope. Why Diffoscope? So, um, let me give you a bit of background detail. So, whilst you can get the source code for pretty much every piece of software, like uh, in free software anyway, you can download the source code and analyze it for security holes, security flaws, and things like that. Most people end up installing binaries. They do, you know, yum install blah, apt install blah, and things like that. And so you can even actually trust that these two things correspond with each other. If you can look at the source code for Nginx, hmm, this looks pretty good, 100% secure, okay, whatever. But, but then you just, you know, you just deploy a server and you're using binaries that someone else has compiled. Can you trust that they have some areas of, any sort of correspondence between the two? This is a problem because build farms can be compromised. So, um, you know, like a compile farm, um, servers running in the cloud. If you could upload pristine source code to it, you know, the, this Nginx source code, for example. Um, but if the compiler has been compromised, if the server has been compromised, you have no idea, you can't trust any of the binaries that come out the other end. You know, just go back doors, attach them. You have no idea. Uh, developers of machines, in a similar way, can be hacked into. I could uh, you know, leave it around my hotel, someone could come in, and you know. So any, any piece of binaries that I then distribute from that, so like ISO images I make and then distribute, they could have um, nasty things on that. I mean, imagine if I was um, generating Windows binaries for. Um, a Bitcoin wallet, it'd be probably worth your while to you know, break into my hotel room or house and install something on my laptop. So, you know, my source code, I can audit it, you can audit it, everyone can audit it. But the binaries I put out are kind of Trojan and someone's stealing everyone's money or, you know, that, this kind of nonsense. And you can also just be blackmailed. So, you, you um, whilst your computer it might be completely fine, someone might come around your house and say, yeah, you know those binaries you're making for your Bitcoin software? Yeah, that's, that's nice. Um, you're a very lovely house, you have a very nice wife, children, I wouldn't want anything to happen to them, just putting it out there. But also law enforcement can lean on you uh, in ways that other people can't. So basically you just don't want to become a target for developers. So this is the basically the uh, reason why. Uh, and this talks about reproducible builds in a sense, as a way of reducing the, the threat model there. So what we do in Review 2 Builds is we basically ensure that every time you build a piece of software, you get the identical results each time. And then multiple parties do the same thing. You do it, I do it, a bunch of other people do it, you know, just randomness. And we'll get together and compare our results. 
And basically what this means is the attacker either has to infect everyone simultaneously, break into all of their homes, break into all of their hotel rooms, all of their bill farms at the same time, or they, they just don't, or just mind changes and things like that. And so basically everyone, they must infect each other, everyone simultaneously, um, and using that you come to a consensus over whether someone has been compromised or not. So if I get a different result to you, why is that? Has my computer broken? Has, has yours been broken into? Once you've got enough people, you can kind of get a sort of probabilistic idea of what's going on. But this means that, as you may uh, notice on the previous slide, identical results. If your build is not, if you can't get an identical build, a reproducible build each time, uh, you, you can't make this, you can't come to this consensus model and things like that. And so we're like, okay, great, let's do this in, in, in Debian, let's try and make Debian reproducible. So we, um, we started out with um, got two devs and build one and then just built it again, you know, basically up, enter, you know, just rerun it. Um, and we you know, run SHA-1 SHA slide, you know, just to see whether, how different they are. Okay, um, so the, 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 the SHAs are different, okay, so the, every, our build is not reproducible. <coughs> And we need the shards to be the same, and then we can compare that shard uh, with, the, say, for example, the shard that you made, the shard that you made, the shard that the build farm to generate. Okay, great. So why are they different? So we basically throw them through um, the Unix diff tool. Everyone knows this tool. You give it two files, and it tells you what difference it is. But this isn't very useful with a binary file. Um, so uh, we can kind of tell that there's a difference here in the file. Uh, yeah, what's going on here? I mean, we can start to see some things initially, like 7z, hmm, okay, yeah, it's probably been gzipped, or, you know, 7z, whatever it's called. Uh, but then, yeah, what's the actual difference? Like, what, what is the difference in our build process? What's actually really different? Because whilst this is absolutely true, it's absolutely useless for a human being in terms of um, being able to take this and go all the way back to, oh, we just need to fix this to stop it using some random number, some random date, and things like that. So yeah, it's like, well, okay, great. Um, so let's just, you know, let's go one level deeper. Well, um, if we, even if we run it through um, uh, XXD, we can see that, oh, oh, some sort of headers are changing here, that's probably some checksum. Um, yeah, I'm not really sure what's going on. And the whole one problem with compressed formats is that a small change can compound into a big change in the binary. So, okay, let's go one level deeper. It's also sort of wrapper around it. So we'll take the wrappers off with ARX, and we end up with a um, control file. Okay, well, that's been, that's also got some differences as well. Um, okay, um, we'll go a bit deeper. We'll um, XZ these control files, and then look at the actual file itself. Okay, we've got a tar. Um, uh, Okay, there's differences going on there. What are they? Don't really know. So we'll um, untar the files. And, oh, okay. So the tar info contains a file called user bin pm mixer. Okay, um, with a different sha one uh, with different md5 sounds. Okay, great. Um, what's the difference there? Um, we'll undo that. Or do the, the same diff on pm mixer. Um, okay, we'll basically back to where we started from. We have no real idea what the real difference is between these two um, things. So basically we should build a better diff because this is just, just useless. You can't, just can't tell what's going on. Build a better diff. So we did, we, and we call it Diffoscope. Um, and just to run you through some very quick examples, you give it two files and it tells you the difference between them. It defaults to the unified diff because why would you want to use the crazy old style diff? Um, so this is just like really basic stuff, a file called A, file called a contains the word foo, a file called B contains the word bar, you run diff on, diff scope on them, foo bar, no real difference, apart from coloured by default, and there's actually a progress bar as well, but whatever. <laughs> Here's diff scope when you pass it to tar archive, so, okay, great, so you start to see this sort of tree structure coming up here, so um, a tar has a file list, and it contains a file called A. B.tar contains a file called B with you know, these particular metadata here 
and A contains food and blah, blah. So you're really starting to see that we can unpack archive formats. You can also do compressed formats. So if those archive formats happen to be um, gzipped, if you run Diffoscope on the actual tar.gz, it will first um, ungzip them, tell you any metadata about that G, um, gzip process. For example, um, gzip happens to encode the last modified time. Why not? And also, usually, it contains the original file name that you can de you compressed it with. So you can this old old there was a reason why for doing that years gone by. But then inside inside these um, gzip. You have a tar file, and then it's there. So you suddenly see that's actually recursive as well. So it started with, it will just recursively unpack all the different layers to get down to the files themselves. For example, here, uh, here's a AFF file, which is in a tar file, which is in an XZ compressed uh, tar file, which is in a DEP, which is a sort of archive format in itself. And it'll just do this for you know, forever, so there are, there's no real limit on how deep it will go and things like that. It also supports more advanced um, detection of um, diffs between files. So for example, um, file A contains these lines are in order, and file B contains these order are in lines that are really hard to read. These all, yeah. Um, you run Diffoscope on them and it'll say, the files are basically the same, but there's just ordering differences. Yeah, so there are differences, but it's just all right. So, yeah. Which is kind of useful because if um, something has been sort of sorted non deterministically, it's like it's the same, but there's some sorting you need to might have to add to. And this is really useful because you can take the idea that, um, that it's not sorted and go, well, okay, what, what um, do we need to change in our build process to just sort these lines? And therefore, the lines will then be in order, etc. And then the build will be useful. And then everyone's happy. It also supports um, um, HTML output mode. So, um, and also this is surreptitiously showing off some more file formats. So you can give it to SQLite databases and it'll actually generate and then diff the SQL commands that are used to generate that database. Very useful. Um, so if your build process um, generates the SQLite database, you can say, oh, okay, one and two, so that's the difference between the two builds. You need to just make sure that in each, every time you build, it uses the same number, etc., etc., etc. But this is a nice HTML, which is a very easy way of showing um, the recursive structure of it when it gets a few levels deep. It's just a bit easier to read. It supports quite a lot of file formats. Um, yeah, we'll probably feel, I'm going to run through some very quickly. Um, it supports Android APK images. It's very useful for um, ensuring things on, for example, FDroid uh, repository are reproducible. Supports Barclay DB databases that are used sort of back in the background extensively in, in um, operating systems, Unix operating systems. Supports Word documents. So that's actually a Word document with um, the, just the letter A and then that's one with B and then it'll just diff them and say, yeah, A and B. Um, EPUB ebooks. Um, doesn't support the Kindle ones yet, but um, it could easily do. Um, and so it's just like, oh yeah, these are, there's it's a date being encoded into the ebook every time you build it. So you can just take that and be like, great, I just need to make sure it uses the same date every time. Now this ebook generation is reproducible. Awesome. Mono binaries, um, Git repositories, yeah, um, and spreadsheets, um, ISO images. This is really useful. Um, so you can give it two ISO images and see whether they're reproducible. So I use this to make the Tails um, operating system, the live CD, etc. Um, reproducible. It's very useful there. Well, even supports images. Um, this is sort of difficult to, to show. Um, but what it will do is it will generate a GIF between the two images. Um, and so you can actually see whether things have been, um, basically see the difference between the two images and things like that. Um, it supports JSON, um, or you know, pretty prints it. So if you, if you give it sort of ugly JSON here with you know, different ordering, it will say, oh no, actually, the only difference is after and before. Okay, great. So it's just got rid of all the kind of noise that you read. It's just kind of getting in the way. Open, yeah, org audio files, um, TCP dump capture files is very useful. If you know you, do, you dump one thing, you, sorry, you do a sort of TCP dump, and then you do another TCP dump. 
it will just say, oh, these are the actual meaningful differences between the two files. True PDFs, again, very useful. Um, XML documents, etc., 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 and many, many more. So how can you use this for QA? I mean, you can use it for PDC or builds, but maybe you're not interested in that. DiffScript is incredibly useful for quality assurance, even if you just want to do normal things. So I, I'm using it all the time to basically just see the changes I want to see, the changes I expect. So um, I might um, I build my piece of software once, great. And then I will make a deliberate change to the source code and rebuild it again and run DiffScope. Now I expect to see some changes between the two things. So for example, if I've changed a conditional, if I've removed something, if I've um, done something else, I basically just want to see that being reflected in the diff between the previous and the new version. Kind of like how you might do test-driven development where you write the test first and see whether it fails. Um, it should do, if it doesn't fail, then there's something interesting there. As a parallel to that, if you uh, made a change to the piece of software and ran Diffiscope and there were no changes whatsoever, at least no meaningful changes whatsoever, you could start to identify, well, okay, there's something wrong with something. It would, it would actually be a cause for concern. So just being able to see in a meaningful way the differences is really important. And often this is possible with a normal diff tool, but if um, the build is not 100% reproducible or there's other random things in, it will just be completely hidden in the noise. Um, but with Diffiscope you can say, oh look, when I change this, just this changes. Brilliant. Great. Um, seeing no changes as I talked about before. This is, I mean, this is uh, the previous idea about just seeing the changes you expect is extremely useful for when you're making, say, a security release. So in those cases, you want to make as minimal changes as possible. You're going to push this out to stable machines that are running stable software. You don't want to break anything whatsoever. So this is a real example. I was actually patching, um, which one this is now? I forgot the name of the software. But um, they needed to just be some small change in the uh, in this <coughs> here, in this Java code. And so I rebuilt the software and ran Diffiscope on the before and after. And I could look right in the Java bytecode and see that the that constant 20 had been changed to 64. There were a bunch of other changes, but that one was definitely in there. And so I was very confident that um, if I ship this out to a whole bunch of systems, to basically every single Debian system, then it wouldn't break in random other ways, which is which is just, just terrible. Mm -hmm. Just yeah, if it's meant to be stable, for example, that's really useful. Uh, security releases. So this is when people, um, mm, yeah, um, naming no names, they you know, just like, oh, here's a new, um, here's a new version of some sort of router firmware. Go and install it because it, the old one's got security holes. Like what? What? what what's the difference? Like you have absolutely no idea. And if you ran um, a naive diff between the, between the old and new versions, you just get a whole bunch of garbage. But you can throw this into um, Diffiscope and it will you know, unpack the, you know, the out of CPIO bar and unpack this other file system image inside and it's like that and it's like that. And tell you the real meaningful differences, basically what they've patched between the old and the new versions. It's extremely useful. So to get started with Diffiscope, uh, um, the quickest and easiest thing to do is to go to try.diffiscope.org and this is basically um, a web interface and you just upload two files file 1, file 2, blah, and then it will then run Diffiscope on a remote server in a sandbox environment and give you the difference. It will give you it in a nice HTML and also a link to the text format as well. So you can just, just find two roughly the similar files in your system, upload them, see what Diffiscope says, if you're worth getting involved. Um, the um, one reason for doing this is, is because Diffiscope has a large number of dependencies to support all the file formats. And if you use the web-based one, which has all the file formats installed, um, you can just basically get all the um, comparison tools without having to install them locally. You can also do this from the command line using the try Diffiscope tool, which is available via pip or, um, or via apt install, etc. Um, things like that. And that will basically do the upload for you, but from the command line, which is very useful. And the current state of Diffiscope, um, here's the commits over time, you know, obviously 
bit of a lull here, you have to result in doing a lot of work here, etc. etc. Um, it's under active development all the time. Um, it's, um, that's mainly because it's being used in the Debian UPT store build project. So for every package in Debian, we build them on multiple architectures in a sort of torture chest, torture, torture test to um, try and weed out reproducible, um, un unreproducible packages. So, um, for example, here is a build of something called Nose, and it's basically saying that there's, it looks like there's some ordering here. So that's on the left build here, it's coming out as enable alpha buffer, and here it says stop, but here it says stop and enable. So basically there's uh, something in the nose build process that's not sorting arguments when generating this manual page. You know, that's just an easy fix once you realize that. So yeah, it's under active development there. Um, we've got, I've done a lot of optimizations. Well, we've all done optimizations as well. So um, this is a graph of um, comparing to NetBSD release tables over time. Um, each one of these is a particular release of Diffoscope. Um, so we did some optimizations here, a bit of a rushing here, some more optimizations here, and then even more options here. So, I mean, compared to, I mean, that's, yeah, yeah a long, 20 minutes down to something like 35 seconds. There's some um, kind of useful use case. And we want to incorporate some parallel processing. There have been multiple previous attempts, some of them in themselves in parallel, which is quite a bit of irony. Um, but we've got some work on that now, um, now Rishi students, and hopefully we'll um, have parallel processing, which will be really, really useful and speed up that 35 second even more. So yeah, um, if you like um, the idea of Diffoscope, um, go to Diffoscope.org, you can download it, or it's probably available in your distribution and things like that. So yeah, thanks very much for your attention. Um, if you've got any questions, please, fire away. Thank you. Starting to take, uh, well, Tails, for example, I haven't done it on Debian ISOs, but for Tails ISO, you know, 800 meg ISO, it was, and we, after those optimizations, we had something like 20 minutes between the two. Um, and they're fairly involved, um, particularly because an ISO contains, particularly the live image, contains sort of binary, um, ELF binaries, and that uses read ELF, which is not exactly the fastest thing ever. And things like that. So it's kind of like the, the worst corner case for it. But 20 minutes for an 800 meg kind of thing. Yeah. But it will really depend on the files that are inside. Because if that's a nicer image of, I don't know, text, it's just going to blaze through that in no time. But if it's, if it's got some advanced file formats that are slow, that are uh, difficult to, to convert into text form, Uh, any more questions? Oh, we Hi, thanks for the talk, quite interesting. Um, I have a slightly different problem. My, my team, uh, some people see absolutely no value in this kind of exercise. Um, I've always felt that what you described in terms of comparing things, being able to assure the quality and compare things, uh, the binaries, certain binaries is extremely important. They have more than two persons in my team currently that are telling me that they don't care. They're ready to pull any binary from anywhere. So basically I would ask you how or what makes you, how will you convince someone that this is what you should do? Sorry, I didn't catch the last bit. How would you convince someone? How would you uh, carry this argument that this actually brings value to your development and your, what you actually output as a, as a team? So I'm finding it difficult to hear there's some echo. Okay. Um, so basically, <coughs> I have this uh, team, and my team, some people complain that this is useless. They basically say they're not interested in comparing binaries, they think it's, there's no value, they're ready to take anything from anywhere. And I've always considered this to be a bad practice, but since I have many people against me, I'm starting to think maybe they're right. 
So how would you um, describe this is good or bad, and how would you convince someone that uh, they are doing the wrong thing when it comes to um, comparing binaries? Um, if I understand your question right, it's um, why would you want to um, basically have a stable build, a reproducible build? Is that a bit, yeah? Um, so even in a sort of, um, is this in a commercial proprietary environment? Oh, right, yeah. I mean, basically, the, the, once you have a reproducible build, the, the, um, you can start to use some of these quality assurance things, like um, you release an update, you can actually just see that there's no differences between the two, um, and things like that. Um, you can also, do these binaries, are these binaries coming from elsewhere, are these artifacts all generating yourself? I mean, um, you can also start to, um, uh, the other thing is that when you have a reproducible build, you can, um, it sometimes pops up security issues as well. I found a number of bugs where build processes would, every time you would build them, it would generate a new secret key or something like that. Um, but then it would include that secret key in the binary that was being um, distributed. And in the, te in the actual process of testing for reproducibility, it would show that the, it was generating a different key each time, which isn't very secure if everyone's sharing the same key, for example. So there's lots of like side benefits that immediately fall out of being reproducible. Yeah. Uh, you support a lot of file formats, but you didn't say so much about what uh, comparison of two elf files would show. How much information do you get for you, for two elf files? Uh, elf binary, files. binaries. Ah, I see. Right. Um, it will, um, for ELF it will basically run um, a very full object dump on the file. So um, it, will, um, it will show you all like, the text sections, for example. So if you have like constants in your file, uh, string constants, it will show the differences between that. That's usually, from a reproducible build's point of view, that's generally the difference. For example, um, the preprocessor might be sh throwing in some timestamp and things like that. Um, it will show uh, differences in opcodes and things like that. So sometimes you can, if you just make a single um, uh, change in a file in, in the source file, for example, you're know, changing a, um, a jump, sorry, an if with a not if, sometimes you can just see that one byte has changed in the eventual binary because it's you know, turned a jump if equal into a jump if not equal, that kind of thing. Sometimes see that. Um, compilers are a bit of your bit of your worst enemy here, in that um, they might do that, and then they realise that because of that they can use some other crazy optimization, and you know, so all bets are off there. Um, and if anything gets reordered, then all your offsets are off, so things like that. So you get this kind of cascading um, waterfall of changes. Um, some sort of decompilation of, of um, things, of binaries, could be um, the next step. Um, for example, if it could actually work out that, oh actually, the difference is it's just this in the operation. Perhaps that can be possible, I'm not sure. Um, but yeah, most of the time it, it's um, the, the meaningful differences can be found in, in just a, a full object, object done. Like that. Yeah, so how uh, extensible would you say this is if I want to write my own? Dig tool to add into this kind of labs, or do I have to change the source code? Um, there isn't a external plugin architecture at the moment, um, but um, that would not be too difficult to add. I mean, the, the source code is pretty hackable, so you could just I mean, it's, it's Python, um, so you can just like just throw your own um, comparison thing in there. That's probably the easiest. And don't try and make a plugin interface. Yeah, it's incredibly easy. I mean, um, in the simplest case, if you have a tool that will, if you give it a file and it'll give the text sort of equivalent to that file, then you can add support for file formats in five minutes. I mean, this is quite easy. If it requires more processing, okay, fine, do a bit longer. But, but yeah, it's, it's quite straightforward to, to add and more support. Do you have a, a file format in mind, for example? Weird text files with strange ordering. Weird text files with strange ordering. 
let's talk. <laughs> okay, yeah, cool. Thanks. Yes. <coughs> Thank you. <coughs> Thank you for Thank you for your talk. Yeah, I was thinking, how can you incorporate this tool with a build infrastructure for a project like Debian for ensuring that Debian's build service hasn't been compromised? So you wouldn't necessarily use Diffiscope for doing that. You'd only use Diffiscope for once you've identified that two builds are different to work out why. So from a reproducible build point of view, it's reproducible if it's bit for bit identical between the two. So if um, you wouldn't use, you wouldn't even need to use SHA-1 some, you'd just use CMP. You know, are the files literally by for by identical? And so um, you wouldn't use Diffiscope at all if you want the, uh, if you wanted to have an infrastructure that would check whether um, your binary is the same that you built yourself versus Debian. You just build it yourself and just compare the files. You don't need to use Diffiscope because. Any difference at all means they aren't reproducible, if that makes any sense. Yes, it does. Thank you. All right, do we have any more questions? Last chance, everyone. This is the last talk of the day. There we go. So, do any of the GUI diff tools come with Diffoscope support? Ooh. No, not well, certainly not that I know of. Um, I think it would have. Um, no, I, I don't think so. Um, so, it's the HTML that is the. The HTML, yeah. I mean, the GUI option <laughs> at the moment. Yeah, and it's, it's pretty. Uh, it's covered most of our use cases, so um, I think, you think of something like meld or something like that? Yeah, yeah. Um, yeah. Not yet. I mean, in some senses it would feel like meld would adopt some of the features of Diffoscope rather than Diffoscope itself being thrown in there. I mean, that. Plus meld is also used for, for merging as well, is that right? I haven't used it for a while. I think so. Like, when you get merges. So the following question might sound a bit involved and theoretical, but have you considered about the security implications of supporting so many formats? So are, is there any work being done to sandbox the actual libraries and utilities that you use to parse those, well, this multitude of formats? Right, um, basically no. We trust the, um, the tool just to work. Um, there has been there has been work done in this area in that, um, for example, I think we had a, a symlink attack in that if in some of the file formats where you, um, you know you have like a, a symlink like dot dot forward dot dot forward and it could, could overwrite files. So we've had at least one CVE against Diffoscope. So yeah, we have done some stuff in that area, <laughs> um, but basically. We can't really do that much about the, um, apart from sandboxing, of course, we can't really do that much about the, um, the extracting utilities, the, the things like that. If, if they go to infinite loops, if they write over your file system, eh, yeah. yeah. But perhaps we should grow sandboxing. That would be, uh, be very interesting. The, the tri scope thing is obviously sandbox itself. Yeah, great, well, thanks very much, and it was great to see you this year. All right, well, that's one of applause.